Do we do that? We're going to be continuing with our discussion on uh, the human body. <clears throat> Let me just uh, kind of remind what we've talked about up until now and give people a, a chance again to take down the lecture notes if you want. When we get to the end, I'll put up a similar QR code with a quiz. And I expect 95 and better. 95 and better is what we're looking for to receive credit. And I know you want to receive credit for this class. I hope you do. Well, in, in looking at, uh, so my, my talks tend to kind of fall into two groups. <clears throat> those that uh, counter natural science, uh, the counter the false teachings of natural science, those that try to convince us that we're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes. I try, we try to counter that. And uh, within that, I, 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 try, I try to include within that a call rep to repentance. I mean, uh, talking about how you know science relates to the Bible is pointless unless uh, ultimately it comes you you bring it back to Christ, and so uh, a lot of my talks uh, are kind of targeted that way. So it's either um, challenging natural science, involving a call to repentance, and much of the, often in much of that, and uh, those that just are designed more to glorify God through a scientific study of his creation by pointing out the amazing things that he has made. I mean, because when we look at the world that's around us, I mean, if you're not, if you don't marvel just constantly at the world that's around you, then you're not paying attention because what God has made is truly fantastic. And in that we can see his love. You know, he, it, the effort that he went into, the time that he went into, the, the thought that went into all of, to make this world for us just shows just how much he loves us. And, you know, I, I know some people try to diminish the significance of it, but that day of rest, he God created the world over the course of six days, and then he rested on that seventh day, and then he, he commanded that as a day of rest for us. That was a, truly a day of rest. You know, some people try to diminish the significance of that by arguing that God is almighty and he doesn't need to, he didn't need to rest, but he did. He was replenished on that day that he put such, think about what kind of God it is that we serve, what he was able to create. The cosmos through the word, you know, spoken into existence and sustained by the word of his power. And I mean, that's such a God of such power and might and, and ingenuity that he would spend so much of himself that he needed to be replenished on that day, I think speaks to the love that he showed us, that he put such effort into making this world for us, making it not just a habitat where we could live, but full of all of these wonderful and beautiful things that he knew we would love, Shh, put things of great mm, power and beauty and, and, and sophistication to reveal himself to us. He went through great effort to make this world for us. And he truly, he rested on that day. And I think that in that, that he spent so much of himself that he had to take a day of rest, I think. Uh, I was going to mention something before getting into this, and then I, I launched right in. Uh, Darren mentioned I was in, uh, uh, um, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we flew back in from Los Angeles last night at midnight. I, was, uh, I took a bunch of high school students down to L.A. on a mission trip. Our school takes a mission week. Every, all the high school students go on a mission trip somewhere. Some are local, engaged in uh, local projects that are arranged for them. Some are more distant. There was uh, some that uh, spent the week at a YWAM uh, base and uh, working on work done construction on uh, stuff out there. There was a group that was uh, that went to uh, Guatemala again this year, and then I took a group to uh, to L.A. to uh, the, to uh, serve at the what's called the Dream Center. Dream Center is a massive. Uh, uh, a facility, not publicly funded, but pure, do, funded by no, a Christian center that's uh, involved in uh, assisting with uh, both homeless, um, drug addictions, uh, poverty assistance, those kind of things. But uh, so we served, uh, we served different, had different, they signed us different projects each day, um, uh, going out to impoverished communities, to fill, fill, f loading up food trucks, fill, f um, filling bags with uh, assorted food items, loading up a food truck taking out to some impoverished neighborhood and setting up a food line where people could come and get them a, f a box of free groceries or uh, and then uh, and then as well walking around like a, a, a skid row uh, the area of Los Angeles they call skid row which is named after Seattle skid row you know but uh, walk the uh, where homeless the homeless encampments are just everywhere tent 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 and so uh, 
you know, walking through there, giving them something and then offering to pray. So I just over and over and over again, we had like some sel some uh, flavored water, seltzer water flavor kind of, and, and some snacks. Now we weren't there to solve hunger, but uh, the, the snacks were just a bridge to, to help break the ice and provide an opportunity for, for to talk to them. And uh, hopefully in that to, to offer, uh, you know, to pr I, I, I would give them something and immediately ask if I could pray for them. And it was amazing, like 90% of the people that I asked to pray for uh, on Skid Row uh, said yes. And I think that tells you, I mean, who would say yes to someone praying for them unless they had some degree of uh, recognition? that there's something greater be behind all of this than just naturalism, you know? People know, you know, and uh, so they would say yes. You know, you know I've, uh, <clears throat> in doing this, I, uh, I came to a realization, I think. I, I'd often, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I avoid, uh, uh, avoid Seattle, downtown Seattle, like the plague. And especially since uh, the jazz business of uh, defund the police movement that allowed them just, and they just allowed people just to take over that jazz area, Seattle, Capitol Hill, autonomous zone, just kept, and you know, the fire bombing the police stations and those kind of things. And it, it's become a place that's just not good for families, you know. I just wouldn't take the kids down there at this point. I mean, we went into the, did the aquarium, but even that was kind of, you know, you didn't really, I just I avoid Seattle. And <laughs> to be honest, I, I've been puzzled. I know Darren lives uh, in downtown Seattle. I was been like, why does Darren <laughs> live in downtown Seattle? But after this trip to LA, I got it. I got it. And uh, I think Pastor Darren does probably does a lot of what we did down in LA, similar things. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I got it a little bit while, you, uh, while you're down there. And I mean, uh, we're called to be uh, a light to the world and not just, uh, you know, to come to church and uh, fellowship with people at our church and, uh, and share the gospel with some, some of your friends or relatives that may not know, but to everyone and uh, to give assistance, to love our neighbors as ourselves, you know, involves doing those kinds of things, you know, going into those areas that you would prefer not to go through, through to because those are your neighbors and you're, we're called to assist them the same way that Good Samaritan helped the, you know, I mean, what's the difference between this, going to Skid Row and helping the people that are injured or broken or, you know, and abstract poverty there and, and helping someone that's injured, an uh, enemy that's injured on the side of the road and putting him. <clears throat> I got it. It was, a, it was an awesome, awesome opportunity, you know, and, and I came back, uh, I think, uh, uh, with a new sense of, uh, uh, I don't know how I want to phrase it. And, newly motivated and I hope it came back with me what we did there talking to all those people uh, just we went to I went through Skid Row and after we'd given our way all our snacks we went to a park that's just you know taken over by uh, the uh, homeless people that are just hanging out at these parks and going to a park without any snacks even at this point and and going through and trying to make con and then trying to talk to people and uh, doing the same thing offering to pray for them and um, hearing listening to them hearing their stories and what their problems are, because you'd have to ask, you know, what, is there anything specific I could pray for? And, and then listen to them and tell them, and have, let them tell them what, what's, what's going on in their life. Offer is, I don't know, it was, a, it was an interesting experience. And uh, I, uh, I've already thought that when that mission trips come around next year, I, wouldn't, I, 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 I would volunteer to go back. Again, take another group of students back to the Dream, Dream Center. Look it up. It's a <clears throat> massive Christian-funded uh, homeless, sh not just homeless shelter, but drug addiction shelter. And, and but then they, it, it's not just, a sh they take it over this massive hospital. So there's lots and lots of uh, residents at this massive hospital. But, and then they, then they do this, uh, these outreaches. One of the neighborhoods that we went to, going around knocking on the doors and stuff, they've been going to for 28 years. So they've been doing this kind of work for a good long time. I doubt that they were in this hospital when they first got going, but it was, it was an amazing experience. And, and uh, 
I just thought I'd give some props to Darren because I think that's a, you know, I, I'm sure he, there's a lot that he does in terms of uh, inner city Seattle ministry that we don't know about. I guarantee you that. Anyway. All right, so we, uh, we, when one of the most amazing things that God has made, I need to reiterate a couple of points just because I would be refer referencing them again. One of the most amazing things that God has made, probably in all of, the, all of creation, was the human body. We are just a marvel of engineering. You could point to so many examples of engineering in the human body that it makes you just pause and go, what in the world, to these scientists that claim that there is no evidence of design out there. People that are, want to argue against intelligent design argue that there's no evidence of design out there. And I mean, how can you look at the, the, some of these things and, and uh, still make such a statement? It's uh, bizarre. We're, we're reminded by, by King David in Psalms uh, uh, one, uh, 139, that you, my Lord, formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it well. So we're taking us a tour of the human body, uh, looking at things that are microscopic, looking at the microscopic and the mac macroscopic level to uh, come to a better understanding of the engineering and design that's in the human body and to develop a better appreciation of who our Heavenly Father is. Though the love that he's shown us is uh, equally matched by his, the, in, the ingenuity of the, the ge and genius of the human body, of the, the engineering that we see there. But again, we have biologists today that e even by bi world-renowned biologists such as Francis Crick, one of the co-discoverers of the DNA helix, that, that recognize that there's evidence of design but won't acknowledge it. He says bi biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved. See, they, they recognize there's design there, but just won't acknowledge it. And you, you, you got to remind yourself that what you see was not designed because they see stuff that appears designed. And, but then they have to constantly, and it's not just every once in a while that you have to remind yourself of such things. You have to constantly remind yourself that what you see was not designed, but rather evolved. I mean, this is, it's, it's a sad state, the state of, na of natural science today, of science that is uh, dedicated to what we call philosophical naturalism today and the extent that they will go to, to maintain their worldview. But maintaining your own worldview is one thing. Trying to impose that worldview on another is, an, is something else. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're teaching this delusion of theirs, this, this they have wanting to pull the uh, blinders over their own eyes and refuse to acknowledge that, that what they see is designed, is not, this is not designed, although it looks like it, and then go on to teach people that the world formed all, on, all by itself through purely natural processes, it's, it's unconscionable. To, to recognize that things are designed to the level that you have to constantly remind yourself that the, it's not, and then to teach as, as though it's an absolute fact that the world formed all by itself through purely natural processes. It's unconscionable, the way, the way they teach this thing. It's all a bunch of big lies, and, and we need to call, call it out for what it is. And they have false teachings and, uh, and outright lies. So one of the big arguments for intelligent design, I had mentioned this before, but I need to mention it again because I'm giving another example today. One of the big arguments for intelligent design or a test for things, something that is intelligent and is designed is, a, is a, what they call irreducible complexity. It's something that is irreducibly complex, if it, and this is kind of way of, of, of uh, summarizing this, is if you cannot reduce it to individual components that serve a function, that still serve a purpose. So you, we find lots and lots of things in the body, whether that be molecular machines, we've seen some of those, or, or organs or entire biological systems that are made of several interconnecting parts and where the removal of any one of those parts would cause the system to cease functioning. Now, Darwin, uh, Darwinism advocates an, uh, to, uh, uh, attempts to explain the origin of complex machinery and the human uh, molecular machines or organs or biological systems through numerous as though they were developed through numerous successive slight modifications this is darwin's big claim he says uh, he says this if it can be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications he's talking here about over countless generations 
that over numerous, uh, to throw oh, generationally, over one generation after generation after generation after uh, other, <clears throat> through numerous successive site modifications, if we can't find something that could not possibly be formed by numerous successive site modifications over ge multiple generations, that his theory would absolutely break down. But we can find out no such case. So what he's what irreducibly com complex structures are, are just these kinds of things. They, they do not function if you have just one part of that machine. They don't function if you have two parts of that machine. They don't function if you have three parts of that machine or four parts of the machine. They don't function unless every single part is there at the exact same time. All those parts have to be assembled together and energy has to be applied to these things to get it to work. No, these things cannot be developed through numerous successive slight modifications over countless generations. They, because in, in Darwinism, uh, natural selection would outselect something that does not serve a purpose or is an expense to the, bo to the body without producing anything. So if it doesn't work, it would be outselected. It wouldn't continue to be produced through several successive generations. That's the, that's the argument. So natural selection would be respons is responsible for these things. And so something like one of these molecular machines cannot simply cannot be built in this way through numerous successive slight modifications. <clears throat> so we've, uh, in, in the course of this, we've been looking at uh, specialized, uh, just to summarize kind of uh, what biological systems are made of. In the human body, there, we have, we found, find con countless different specialized cells, highly different specialized cells, and these specialized cells, uh, uh, when they work together to perform a common function, we call these tissues, and there's several different tissues that are responsible for making things like organs. Uh, you have connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and these four main t kinds of tissues are what are assembled together to make organs. So the heart has those four kind of tissues. The stomach has those four kind of tissues. The liver has those four kind of tissues. It's a complex, complex thing. And these things are not just interconnected, but interdependent upon one another. All right, so just wanted to give a brief review. What we're, what we've been looking over are several biological systems. So a group of cells working together to perform a common function makes up a tissue. Several tissues working together to perform a common function makes up an organ. Several organs working together to perform a common function make up biological systems. And we've been looking through some of these systems. We looked through uh, the skeletal system, we looked through the nervous system, including uh, some aspects of the sensory system like the eye. We looked at the respiratory system and uh, in, in the process of that pointed out some of these uh, astounding molecular machines. Uh, uh, as we finished off our discussion on the respiratory system, uh, I introduced you to the a this, this molecular machine called the ATP synthase, which uh, is responsible for making the main energy carrier for the body called ATP. We breathe in oxygen and breathe off carbon dioxide because oxygen is necessary to break down carbohydrates, the main carbohydrate being glucose, and it breaks down that carbohydrate, which is a big energy carrier, in order to make a smaller energy carrier called ATP. But this particular molecular machine is composed of 500 individual separate protein subunits. Multiple different types of proteins are responsible for making this, and I mean, it's a complex molecular machine a turbine engine like mo our engines though which are driven by a flow of electrons this one is driven by a, a flow of protons but these are the kind of molecular machines that we look that we uh, have discovered in the human body molecular machines that simply cannot be built by numerous successive site modifications well, the, one of the last, uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of other related systems, uh, that being the circulatory system. We'll look a little bit at the immunity system in the process of this. So let's look, about, look at the circulatory system. So the circulatory system is a, a massive network of transportation vessels responsible for delivering the materials that are needed by the 100 trillion cells that make up the human body. Materials are delivered for the respiratory system, the digestive system, the excretory system, and the endocrine system. These systems are all interconnected and interdependent upon one another. Well, to accomplish this monumental task of delivering all these materials from all these various systems to the, all the, tr the hundreds, the trillions of cells that are in our body, it is equipped with, with close to 100,000 miles of blood vessels. 
The circulatory system is made up of close to 100,000 miles of blood vessels. Now, to better understand how, mu how long uh, this system of, of, of vessels is, the circumference of the Earth is 25,000 miles. The circumference of the Earth at the equator is 25,000 miles. So the blood vessels in your body, if attached end to end, would go around the Earth four times. I, there was, a, there was a, a, a couple of times there was a, a, a traveling exhibit that came to Seattle called the Bodies Exhibit, which had a bunch of human bodies in there at various stages of a dissection. And, and uh, there, was a, there was one that was just the circulatory system. They had managed, they had to, to removed all the rest of the tissue and just left behind the circulatory system. So they had full circulatory system of the human body and like an arm that was sitting there. And I, I was sitting there just astounded at this arm, and with, including the hand, that was just the blood vessels. And looking at it, it was so, there were so many blood vessels there, and so, I, it was hard to imagine where the, how could you fit all that muscle in there? I mean, it was just the whole, it was, seemed like an entire hand and arm of nothing but blood vessels. It's, it's extraordinary amount of blood vessels that make up the circulatory system. Well, to accomplish this uh, monumental task of delivering through all these vessels, the circulatory system is, uh, uh, is, is, is uh, equipped with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the most heart, the, the, the most, the hardest working organ in the human body, and that's the heart. Now, the heart is, uh, is a pump that uh, beats 100,000 times each day, about 40 million times a year, that's three billion times during the average human lifespan. It pumps a total of 1.5 gallons every minute. That's enough to fill more than 40 50 gallon drums per day. A million barrels would be filled by the heart in, a, in the average lifespan. In one hour, the heart outputs the energy necessary to lift almost 2,000 pounds or one ton, three foot off the ground. That's about the weight of a small car or an elephant. And the, the heart does this day in and day out. Now consider this, if the skeletal muscles like your uh, you know, biceps or your quadriceps or something did this, if they contracted at, at, on this rate, they would be useless in minutes. I mean, the, the heart is, is unique as far as, as far as muscle is concerned in the body. No other, no other muscle in the body can continue to contract like this without uh, exhausting itself and become useless. Well, one other imp very important function of the circulatory system is blood clotting. Uh, blood clotting is necessary because when we get cuts or something, we, the blood can leak out. And you don't have an, a, t a tremendous amount of blood, only like six liters of blood in the human body. And uh, so if the blood flow wasn't stopped after an injury, uh, I mean, you would uh, die within minutes. So b blood clotting is necessary to prevent blood loss when uh, one, a blood vessel is damaged to prevent blood from leaking out. To do this, the blood has a special and very complex repair procedure in place. Once initiated by a cut or damage to a vessel, uh, there is a component in the blood that is activated, which in, ten, in turn activates another component, and it activates another component. It's a series of cumulative, mutually dependent steps a physiological chain of, uh, or, or what we call a cascade of chemical reactions that results in the formation of a solid obstruction to prevent blood loss. Now the reason, but this process has to be um, highly regulated because every single component that's necessary to make a blood clot is right there in your bloodstream. What a blood clot is, is hardened blood. And the components necessary to harden up your blood are right there in your bloodstream. So if there was any error anywhere in this process, your entire circulatory system could just harden up. So here are some of the main components of the blood clotting cascade. These are all proteins. Um, a couple of the main ones are fibrinogen, and uh, then there's one called prothrombin that I've uh, circled for you there. Also, there's one called proaccelerin, another called Stewart factor. And uh, none of these proteins are used for any other purpose in the body except uh, to make a blood clot. Now, as I mentioned, this is also self-limiting. I'll cir or circle a couple of the feedback loops that are involved with uh, blocking this process until uh, proper activation signals are put in place. It needs to be highly regulated in this way because, again, uh, if, uh, if there was ever an error, 
in this cascade of events, then the entire blood uh, blood flow, the pl entire supply of blood in the human body could uh, could solidify in just uh, in just a couple of minutes. Well, uh, this is a very, very complex process, and so uh, to explain this a little better, I'd like to de uh, uh, allow an expert to uh, handle a little better explanation to you of just how blood clotting works. After the platelets change their shape to accommodate the formation of the plug. Oh, sorry, I digress. Anywho, this complex thing called the Stewart factor converts prothrombin to thrombin, thereby converting fibrinogen to fibrin. By the way, Always better to let the experts handle these subjects. That's not my thing. Well, Michael B. He in his book, uh, Darwin's Black Box, has uh, noted that the blood clotting cascade is an example of irreducible complexity. He says this, the removal or degradation of just one, any one of the components or steps would cause the cascade to fail. Obviously, this would have dire consequences for the organism. It is exceedingly difficult to see how the clotting cascade could have evolved as any postulated, simplified, or primitive version of the process would result in failure. Hmm. Well, a related subject to this is the immune system. Now, the immune system is responsible for providing pr protection from infectious organisms and or viruses. Multiple systems of the body are, are <coughs> interdependently involved in this process. Circulatory system is involved in the immunity system. Skeletal system is involved. The lymphatic system is one of your main systems. And also the integumentary system, your skin, is also one of your main lines of defense against uh, infe infectious organisms. and. Uh, Within the circulatory system, you have multiple specialized cells that are involved in the immunity system. We call these white blood cells. Now, everything you can I, the red blood cells are the ones that are red. Everything else in this image is, is responsible, is part of the immunity system. They're all various uh, cells of the immunity system. I don't know if I can point to that. These are lymphocytes right here. These are actually platelets that are involved with the blood clotting, but you have uh, macrophages and neutrophils. I'll, let me show you what another what one of these looks like. This is one of the main uh, um, eating cells in the body. This is called a, a neutrophil. There's a couple of different white blood cells that eat stuff in the body. Now these are like autonomous cells that kind of cruise around in your body looking for stuff that shouldn't be there and eating it. Neutro this is a neutrophil. The yellow things that you see here are neutrophils and they're eating bacteria. These are rod shaped bacteria. These are the, actually the bacteria that cause anthrax. But neutrophils are, uh, are w the smaller of the eating cells. Uh, they can eat about 10 things before they die. A big, there's a bigger version of an eating cell called a macrophage, which can eat about 100 things before they die. But these are, uh, uh, they move, th they crawl around inside the body, a type of movement called amoeboid movement, not like the cilia that we saw before, the flagellum that we saw, but these are moved through amoeboid movement. They kind of crawl around inside the body looking for things that shouldn't be there. Here's a video of a neutrophil actually chasing down a bacteria. I mean, these things are just cr crawling around inside your body looking for things that shouldn't be there. There's a they have a way of identifying your cells uh, uh, from other cells, that your cells are labeled with a protein tag called the major histocompatibility complex that identifies your cells as self. Anything else that isn't, uh, doesn't possess that tag is going to get uh, eaten. But that's pretty cool. I mean, you got these little cells in your body just kind of cruising around in the body looking for things that shouldn't be there and, and gobbling them up. And of course, uh, that would also be the case for a uh, uh, for can things like cancer cells, if those are going haywire too, your immune system is responsible for that. Well, one of the coolest parts of this process is the way that the immunity system cells cooperate to reach a decision about how to respond to infections. Now, this is a process called, uh, I want to describe to you a process called antigen presentation. Now, 
antigens are in, is like uh, things in the body that shouldn't be there that the immunity system would get rid of. Uh, specifically, uh, things that an antibody would bind to. I'll describe what antibodies are in a second. But a piece of something that shouldn't be in the body, that's an antigen. First, what, in antigen presentation, what happens is a cell, one of these eating cells, will eat something that shouldn't be there, one of these antigens, and then it chews it up into pieces, and then it hands a piece of it to another cell antigen presentation. It presents a piece of this thing that shouldn't be in the body to this other cell called the helper T cell. And then the helper T cell makes it helps, they decide, it decides what to do. And there's several things that could be done. Uh, it could, the helper uh, T cell could decide we need to activate killer T cells. Maybe it's one of your cells that is going, like one of your cancer cells, or, or get, they get got rid of by the killer T cells. It could also activate uh, what's called a, a T helper cell that will activate macrophages or neutrophils, the eating cells of the body. If those need to be activated to go get rid of this thing, whatever it was that they had been found inside the body, or it can, it can uh, activate B, B cells, which are a specialized white blood cell whose job is to make antibodies. But this, I mean, Pretty cool. They actually talk to one another. Here, I found this thing. Here's a piece of this thing. What do you want to do about the, what should we need to do about this thing? And then there's several different potential strategies could be decided on. It's pretty cool. But let me show you what the antibodies are about. So and what antibodies are is uh, they're labels. So antibodies are those Y-shaped things that you see there. They will attach to something and they label it as foreign. And they also, antibodies also interfere with viral replication. So not only does it target something for destruction, they label it, labeling it for destruction, so your macrophages will come in and uh, destroy it, but they also interfere with viral replication. But the, the antibodies, the an whole antibody system is very, is a, what they call lock and key system, which means that the antibody, see this antibody is like binding to something on the surface of the cell. This is like a big, this is a virus, sorry, not a cell. This is like a big virus, and these antibodies are attaching to this virus. But an antibody will only attach to one thing, and it only attaches to one thing. And the cell that makes an, an antibody, these B, B cells that make antibodies, only make one antibody. What's more, what's more uh, uh, kind of interesting about this is that the cells that make antibodies don't exist until, you're expo until your body's exposed to an infection. They don't exist, okay? And the, so the antibodies don't exist to label something as foreign until you're exposed to that foreign thing. What has to happen is your body has to make new DNA. So antibodies are themselves proteins, but it's a very, very specific protein that will only bind to one thing, and the cell that makes an antibody only makes one antibody. But the, the gene that is necessary to make that antibody doesn't exist until you're exposed to that foreign substance. So you have thousands of genes today that you were not born with. All of the genes that make the antibodies that are responsible for your immunity are new. You're given some by your mother. If you're, if you're breastfed, the mother could pass antibodies to the children. Otherwise, those are the genes that make the antibodies are, do not exist until you're exposed to something that's foreign. And this is kind of a remarkable process. What happens is that you have several gene templates that can be used to make a new gene. These are these B cells. They have gene templates, and there's three different ones. They're labeled here, they're V, labeled V, D, and G, and J segments. So. What, what, the, what the B cell does is it takes these templates and then it assembles them together. There are 400 possible V gene segments that can be used to make a new antibody gene, and the B cell chooses one of them. It then is combined, there's then 15 different D segment templates, and it takes one of those. There's four different J segment templates. It takes one of those and assembles those together to make a new gene to make a new gene to make an antibody. Well, this, by assembling these available gene, gene templates together, a total of 24,000 genes can be made just from these different combinations. But then scientists became very puzzled by the fact that uh, um, 24,000 combinations can be made by assembling these, these uh, d the different templates together, and yet the body seems to be able to make an unlimited 
number of antibodies from unlimited number of gene segments. A millions of different antibodies can be made, although there's a limited number of gene templates. And so this is puzzled scientists when they, real, when they discover this. And so in classic evolutionary thinking, what they proposed was that mutations were responsible for making, so when it spliced those templates together, it would do so very haphazardly, overlapping some segments, uh, not splicing them together correct, quite correctly, leading, which created some errors you know, in, in splicing these things together. And so by just randomly putting together templates that were accidental, by assembling the gear very haphazardly and randomly, it could make bazillions of genes doing this, doing it this way. Classic evolutionary thinking. See, they don't, they're not looking for a design. They assume random process is responsible for everything. And so they, that's what they, that's their assumption. And so they, because of this, progress in molecular biology, molecular genetics has just been at a snail's pace. If they recognize that this, this thing is designed, they would be looking for design, they would be looking for purpose. They just assumed that most of the, most of the DNA was junk and they had to eventually stumble across the purposes of these genes. Now we know that there's no junk DNA. I've gone into that before, but they, so if your assumptions are correct about this world, your discoveries are more likely to be accurate or, you know, they, they, they're looking at this from the wrong perspective. So eventually they d discovered that this was not the case, that there were random mutations were not responsible for making these antibodies. It assembled those templates together and then the B cell comes back through and makes single nucleotide edits on that gene to make the exact antibody that is necessary to attach to that foreign thing. It has a few templates it can use to get it close, but then it comes back through and edits it. Single nucleotide edits are made to make the exact gene that is necessary to make the exact antibody that will bind to that foreign substance. It's, a, it's amazing. I, uh, I, I published an article for, I, I went through all that explanation. I published an article about this uh, a, a number of years ago in the Journal of Creation, going into some detail in that if you had any, uh, any interest in uh, looking at that a little bit later. You can ask me to pull up the QR code a little bit later. <clears throat> well, the way that they do this, uh, so, so let me, let me I'm gonna show you another recent discovery okay, that reveals how white blood cells are able to locate damaged or infected tissues. Okay, this is remarkable. So white blood cells are these, uh, those, like those uh, macrophages or neutrophils, right? White blood cells are, use, your, use your circulatory system for transport, and it was assumed that they were swept along with the plasma like your red blood cells are. The liquid portion of your bloodstream is called plasma, and your red blood cells are suspended in this plasma and being tra are transported around inside your body. White blood cells also use a circulatory system for transport, and it was assumed originally that they were swept along with the plasma like your red blood cells are. They come to find out that this is not the case. They are not suspended in the plasma. Instead, they crawl along, They're, they stay attached to the blood vessel wall and crawl along the surface of the blood vessel wall. This is a, an animation of, the circ, of a circle of blood vessel vessel with the red blood cells that were being swept along and then you can see I'm going to see if I can back this up and show you one more time you see yeah I want to stop that let me back up so you can see the red blood cells being swept along and on the surface those blue things are white blood cells these white blood cells are not being swept along with the plasma but are crawling along the inside of the blood vessel wall and they make connections with the blood vessel wall. There are proteins on the surface of the white blood cells that connect to proteins on the blood vessel wall, like this. So that's the white blood cell right there, and it has proteins that are on it. The blood vessel wall has proteins that are on it, and it makes its continuous connections with the blood vessel wall, okay? And the reason why it does this, because it's the blood vessel ultimately, the blood vessel wall ultimately communicates to the white blood cell where the site of infection is. And it does this through this mechanism. This is, a, this is recently, very recently discovered stuff. The, at, the, at the site of inflammation, these proteins right here reach up and make connections with the outside of the blood vessel wall. That causes the white blood cell, when it reaches that point, to stop in its tracks. 
So at the site of inflammation, the site of infection, a, this, the blood a signal is sent to the blood vessel wall that communicates that signal to the, to the white blood cell that causes it to stop in its tracks when it reaches that point. The white blood cell then flattens itself out, squeezes between the, the cells of the blood vessel wall and goes out into the tissue to find the infection or the whatever's in there to, that's causing inflammation to destroy it. That's pretty cool stuff, man. You know, pretty cool stuff. Well, one other really important uh, function of the circulatory system is temperature regulation. Most people don't know this. Your blood, your circulatory system has amazing ability to control blood flow. Can control blood flow through almost every vessel in the body because of a smooth muscle that surrounds these blood vessels. So you can smash down on these blood vessels or open them up, and in doing so, control it is involved with temperature regulation. These are capillaries, the smallest, uh, the smallest blood blood vessels in the body called capillaries. They're so small that red blood cells will flow through them in single file. They're only big enough for one cell to flow through, but it can open and close these as needed to regulate your temperature. So if you ever like are out playing a sport or see someone that's playing a sport, because most, I mean, most of us probably aren't playing sports anymore, but we just watch other people play sports, you know? If you see someone playing sport, especially if they're kind of pale complexion, you see their face get really red. That's because to, to radiate off heat, the blood vessels at your surface are opened up to help you radiate off heat, or when you're getting cold, those blood vessels will be closed down to help you conserve heat, to keep the, to conserve the heat in your core. It's an amazing level of, of, uh, of control over the circulatory system that's, that's present there. Well, an even more extreme revision of blood flow occurs at the exact moment of birth. Now, so significant modifications of the, of the fetal circulatory system are made just at the moment of birth. And this is necessary because before birth, the lungs, digestive system, and liver are not yet active. Oxidative nutrients are, received, are, are provided by the mother. They're received from the baby by the mother's blood flow through the placenta, and the mother also provides oxygen and carries away carbon dioxide, also carries away waste. So the liver and, and the kidneys are not functional in, in, until birth. Because of, these, uh, because of these differences, special modifications uh, in fetal, circula fetal circulatory system permit blood to bypass the lungs. The blood is, does not go to the lungs until the moment of birth, until the baby starts breathing. <coughs> so a couple of, there's a couple of major modifications of the heart that make this happen. One's called the foramen overlay. Now what happens normally is the blood that comes back from the body comes, goes into the right atrium, so this is a right atrium. Normally blood that comes back from the body goes to the right atrium, down into the right ventricle, and then out to, through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. To prevent this from happening, there's a, an opening right there so that the blood that comes into the right atrium will go automatically to the left atrium and then out to the body, bypassing the lungs. But any blood that happens to, so there's another one called the ductus arteriosus. This, if any blood does make it from the right atrium down to the right ventricle, it then diverts blood that from the, from the pulmonary artery to the aorta so that it again goes out to the body. Then there's, a, there's another one called the ductus venosus that similarly causes blood to bypass the liver. These are significant chain differences in the heart. I mean, a big opening right there in the heart that will allow the blood to just completely bypass the, the whole, so the lungs, you know? At the moment of birth, these are closed off. It's a very, very precisely timed modification of, fe of the fetal circulatory system that happens at the exact moment of birth. Uh, and, and I mean, there's a, a right, the whole process of development is so highly uh, organized and regulated that uh, 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 planning, uh, that's, it, due, due to convenience, a, a, lot of, a lot of women just go ahead and choose to come in and have, uh, have uh, the, uh, the birth induced at a particular point in time instead of waiting for it to happen on its own. But this is such a highly regulated process that inducing birth before the body's actually ready for birth is, is not really wise when you get right down to it. But uh, 
Well, anyway, uh, let me see if I can get my mouse back over here. This is pretty bizarre. Well, fetal development is itself a, uh, a, a remarkable process wherein a single cell divides multiple times and then individual cells are assigned their roles. Remember, at one point in your life, you were one cell. That one cell then divides. After fertilization, that one cell divides a whole bunch of times, and those individual cells are assigned their various roles. Some are told to become muscles, some are told, told to become nerve cells, some are told to become sensory cells. Well, let me show you just how, I can kind of give you an idea of just how quickly this process takes place. Now, this is not a human uh, fertilized egg. This is a zebra fish, but that's one, the fertilized egg that now is divided tw once, now twice. Now you see eight cells, it's gonna divide again. And now you got 16 cells and now it divides again. So you got 32 cells and now it divides again. You got 64 cells. Notice how it, it doesn't change in size either. There's, so th it's not, mm, stays the same size, but now and it quickly you, the cells are so small that you can no longer make them out the way you could originally. You can see the, the big uh, fertilized egg, but then that fertilized it divides over and over and over again. What you can see here is already the development of the vertebral column. You can see vertebrae laying down right there. You can already, you can already make out the outline of an eye right there. There's the eye. Now, zebrafish are much simpler than humans, and the, their genome, the, the genetic makeup of the zebrafish is much, much smaller than in humans. Um, so the process is a lot quicker than it is in humans. But still, you know, what, what, you, what, do you, what, what would you think that length of time would be? From the fertilization to this moment, where you already have vertebral column already kind of being laid out, you already have sensory organs that are being developed, you might think that that was, uh, you know, a few weeks, at least a few days, 21 hours. 21 hours following fertilization to reach that point. Now, again, in humans, the process is much more <coughs> complex because we're a much more complex organism and our genome is much larger. Uh, Three billion base pairs in, co in comparison to the tiny genome of a zebrafish. But let me go through the developmental process and the, and the, the timing of these events. After, uh, uh, after approximately 30 hours, so after 30 hours after fertilization, the fertilized egg, which is called a zygote, divides into two. Then 15 hours later, the two cells divide into four. After three days, there are 16 cells. So it takes three days. And that's because, mainly because of the size of the genome and the, the, uh, the it's much more comp complex nature of the human cell over something like a zebrafish. After five days, five days after fertilization, the embryo at this point is called a blastocyst and has about a, a hundred cells. It is then carried by cilia, those motor protein cells that we saw previously, to the uterus where it becomes implanted. During the next two to three week period, the implanted embryo undergoes a, a, some major transformational changes as the cells begin to morph into the new cell types that become the millions of specialized cells, tissues, and organs it takes to make a baby. And this intricate cellular choreography is regulated by growth factors and hormones that are turned on and off at specific times and locations in response to signals from the embryo's genes. At 32 days, the head and the eye lens are clearly visible. The upper and lower limbs are growing and show distinct digits. You can see, make out the fingers there. The internal organs, the heart, liver, and pancreas are also visible. The heart actually starts beating at around 21 days. At about one and a half months of age, the eyes and the other sensory organs are substantially developed at this point. At eight weeks, they are officially known as a fetus, but uh, I guess it's okay to use uh, different developmental terms, but I would call them a baby. Sadly, nearly half of all abortions are performed after the eighth week of pregnancy. And this is, this is at eight weeks right here. Now, they're very, very tiny at this point, but uh, what, is, what was the old Dr. Seuss uh, is saying? Uh, a, a person is a person no matter how small. What is it, something like that? I mean, how big is our God in comparison to us? I don't think it matters whether we're one centimeter in size or six feet in size to our God. Yeah. But again, uh, 
By the time an unborn baby is this age, all of the internal organs are functional. All of them. They tend to, they, the abortion advocates try to diminish this, how significantly developed the baby is at this stage, cause, calling it a clump of cells and those kind of things. But at this point, all the, all the internal organs are fully functional. Fingers and toes are fully formed. To uh, better uh, illustrate this, let me show you an MRI, uh, magnetic resonance image of a eight, eight week old baby. So this is uh, one of the techniques that can be used to peer in and as, as, the, as it scans around, you can see that at eight weeks, all of the internal organs are fully functional. There is full, it's fully developed, it's, it's a tiny baby, so a lot of growth has to take place, but at this point, all the internal organs are fully functional. By the ninth week, the baby has fingerprints. At 10 weeks, they are pain capable and uh, can smile, been seen to smile at 12 weeks. However, when humans are viewed as just another animal and there is no ultimate foundation for ethics, people can justify horrible atrocities against others like the slaughter of helpless children. Today, abortion is the number one cause of death worldwide. By the age of 45, about one in three couples in the U.S. will have an abortion. And very troublingly, uh, 73% of abortions in the U.S. are by people with religious affiliations. The World Health Organization reported in 2021 that there are around 73 million reported abortions performed per year. That's about 2.3 children per second. In the United States alone, there are nearly 1 million abortions performed per year. That's about one every 32 seconds. And we can attribute many of these deaths to the horrendous uh, Supreme Court ruling of Roe v. Wade, which uh, back in 1973, which legalized abortion nationwide. Most of these deaths could be uh, avoided with better laws. I, uh, I'll provide an overview of where we are legally. As of 2018, uh, only 42 states required an abortion to be performed by a licensed physician. Only 43 states prohibited abortions perfor being performed after a specific point in pregnancy. Only 20 states had laws that prohibited partial birth abortions. This is, is an abortion wherein the children are partially delivered before killing it and completing the delivery. Only 18 states mandated that women be given counseling before abortions. Only 27 states required a waiting period to have an abortion, usually uh, 24 hours. You have to make an appointment, wait 24 hours just to make sure it's not an impulse uh, or heated decision that was been made. Only 37, hour, uh, 37 states required parental involvement in the minor's decision to have an abortion. In many states, including Washington, chill, girls can go in and have an abortion without parental consent, and there's no age limit. There is no age limit, meaning a 10-year-old girl could walk into an abortion clinic and they would perform that surgery without parental consent. These kids cannot go to the church, the, the school nurse, and get an aspirin without parental consent, and yet they can walk into an abortion clinic and kill their baby. Major surgery in many cases. Well, again, most of these deaths could be avoided uh, with the better laws. In 2022, you may know that the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. As a consequence, many states enacted either <clears throat> enacted laws either restricting or expanded abortion rights. When North, Carolina, uh, uh, when North Carolina enacted restrictions in 2023 against abortions after uh, 12 weeks of gestation, uh, <clears throat> facility-based abortions uh, dropped by 31% the first month when they just restrict abor abortions to, be, uh, to not be allowed after 12 weeks of gestation. Today, 14 states in the U.S. have a near total ban in effect. The states shown in red have a near total ban 
on abortion following the overturn of Roe v. Roe v. Wade. Others, like Oregon, Vermont, Minnesota, New Jersey, Maryland, my, and my home state of New Mexico, moved to legalize abort abortion so it could be performed all the way to birth. Many states have legalized abortion up to the point where the baby could survive on its own, called the, a point of vi fetal viability. If the baby could survive on its own, then they, they will allow it only up until that point. Michigan, Vermont, and California have protected abortion rights through a constitutional amendment. They've amended their state constitutions to make sure that people could kill their babies. Well, people are acting like they have the right to kill their children, even if they would simply be inconvenient. These terrible crimes are committed against the most vulnerable people in our, in our world today, and we must fight to protect them. And I'll, I don't know how to advocate well for this. Join, do we join in on protest marches or uh, picket outside abortion clinics? People that pick it outside abortion clinics have been put in jail just for doing that. Some have been sentenced to year terms. There are also a, a number of pro-life organizations like uh, those shown here that are instrumental in lobbying our politicians uh, and had and been effective in, 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 in uh, getting things passed like dismemberment bans, um, uh, preventing the types of abortions where they would just dismember a baby, or Pain Capable Protection Act, where the abortion was blocked after the baby was pain capable. These groups could all use financial support. That's something we could all do. I'll mention that there's a, uh, I, I was, uh, in, I was, just before I came up, I, I, I wanted to mention that there is a, uh, a march coming up in, uh, Let's see, do I have the date? And then April 28th, so it's a uh, uh, life, there's the, there's the website address. You don't need the entire website address, but lifepnw.org is where you can go to find information about this specific event. Coming up April 28th, they announced it uh, at Cedar Park this morning. We were attending church at Cedar Park. So uh, May, April 28th from uh, like 3 to 5 p.m., they're going to be uh, doing a march beginning uh, in downtown Bellevue Park. Well, and we must educate people about who they really are. See, people around us have been, become convinced by the false teachings of natural science, convinced into believing that this world somehow magically came into existence all on their own, and believing that they're nothing but a bunch of evolved apes. And again, when you believe you're an evolved ape, you'll treat yourself like, an, like you're just another animal. When you believe other peoples are animals, you'll teach them like they're, uh, treat them like they're just a bunch of animals. <clears throat> but Genesis 1.26 says that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Now, these are not references to, to a physical appearance of God, since uh, Jesus says in, in John 4.24 that God is spirit. And in uh, Luke 24, 39, that spirit does not have flesh and uh, blood. Therefore, we can conclude that, that we reflect the character and attributes of God, such as uh, compassion, rationality, love, even hatred. We were made in the image of God. For example, man has a free will. Man knows the difference between good and evil, and only mankind has produced great scientists, composers, prophets, and poets. According to the Genesis record, man was made in the image of God. That means he had attributes, abilities, capacities that God had given him. When we read the Genesis 4 record, which is after the fall, we still see these abilities and capacities. For example, man could build cities. He could make and play musical instruments. He understood metallurgy. He understood agriculture. He could write poetry and literature. As well, man was created with a spiritual component. Man had a free will to choose, had a conscience. Humans are truly a wonder of God's creation. We are the pinnacle, the very purpose of the creation itself. And we should not forget how important each and every life are to him. 
We should not be, we should not forget how much he loves the people that are out there. When we see people on the streets, those homeless people, we should not forget how much he loves them, what he's done for them, and try to wake them up to the truth that we know. We are in possession of a great truth. And your fa failure, our fa failure to share that with people when opportunity presents itself is on us. They are lost. The world that surrounds us is lost. They've been uh, convinced by tremendous false teachings, propped up by scientific evidence that they are nothing but a, an evolved animal. And we have to wake them up to the truth of who they really are. They're not an animal. They're made in the image of God and they're loved by their creator more than they can possibly even comprehend. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, I, Lord, I thank you for these opportunities. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to go to LA, for being able to share here this evening, Father. And Father, we pray today for more opportunity, more opportunity to share your word, to share the truth that we know with the world that's around us, Lord. And, and today, Father, we ask for, we ask for boldness, Father. Convict us, Lord, when we fail to speak, when the opportunity presents itself, Father, and embolden us. Give us the courage, this, the conviction to share what we know, the, tr the truth that we know. Give us boldness, Father, and courage to, God, to, to not shrink back from uh, the scientific findings that people believe, Father, because we are in possession of a great truth. Help us to speak with boldness, Father, because we do know the truth of this world and the truth about who we are and the truth about who people are that we would share the gospel with. We know the truth about who they are. Give us the words to speak, to, co to, to communicate that to them, who they are and how much you love them. Help us, Lord, to, to share to the world that's around us the truth that we know and help them to come to understand how valuable they are to the God that created them and how much they are loved. Father God, we praise you. We praise you, Father. We thank you, Father. We love you, Father. We love you. We love you, Father. We love you because you first loved us and you gave us the capacity to love, that we are made in your image and you have shared your capacity to love with us, given us that capacity. And Father, we ask to you to help that love grow within us, Father. Pour your Holy Spirit into us and help us to show the, lo show the love that we should to our neighbors, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to show them that they're loved by the, the, the of through our eyes, through our words, through our actions, help us to show the love that we should have. Father God, praise you and thank you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.